Talking about not, it's not, they aren't just talking. If you're in the article, is on page 516. If you're in any other Chumash, it's in chapter 35 of the book of Exodus, Shemos. The name of this week's Torah portion is Vayakel. Vayakel means, and he gathered. Moses gathers the Jewish people. And Rashi tells us this was the day after Yom Kippur. It was the day after Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was the day that Moses brought down the second set of tablets after God forgave us for the sin of the golden calf. And it became a permanent day of forgiveness, Yom Kippur, <clears throat> until this very day. And the very next day, Moses gathers the Jewish people and begins to instruct them once again about the laws of the building of the Mishkan. And by way of introduction, he talks about the day of Shabbat. So what we basically have is two things, Shabbat and the Mishkan. And the question is, what's the connection between the forgiveness of the golden calf, which was on Yom Kippur, Moses bringing the second set of tablets, which was God's granting them a second chance. And the very next day, he says, let's talk about two things, Shabbat and the building of the Mishkan. And here we find a very fascinating correlation between all of the above. So when the Jewish people worship the golden calf, we find the same exact word. The root of the word is kahal, which means congregate. The name of this week's Torah portion is Vayakel Moshe. Moses congregated the Jewish people together and spoke to them collectively. When they made the golden calf just uh, last week, it says, Vayikahalu. They congregated around Aaron, the brother of Moses, after they saw that Moses had delayed in his returning from heaven. They went into panic mode, into fear, into distress, into a frenzy. And they congregated around Moses and they said, let's make a new God. I'm just going to read it to you. It's chapter 32. Vayarhan, the nation saw Kiboshes Moshe, that Moses delayed Laredet Minahar from descending from the mountain. Vayikahel, it's actually the same word, different vowels. Vayikahel, here it's Vayakel. They gathered, they congregated the nation. Vayikahel, Am, Al Aron, on Aaron, and they said, let's make a new God that will lead us, because Moses, who took us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. So is it by coincidence? Clearly not. In last week's Torah portion, they congregated to make an idol. Now Moses says, now we're going to atone for that sin. And how are we going to do that? By congregating to do what? Keep Shabbat and build a Mishkan. Why? Why these two mitzvot specifically? So we know that the building of the Mishkan in general was an atonement for the sin of the golden calf. The obvious reason was, that they built a golden calf by contributing their gold and silver. Up until then, they were passive Jews. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to contribute anything. God took them out of Egypt. God made 10 plagues. God split the sea for them. God gave them the Torah at Mount Sinai. And then they made a golden calf. And God says, okay, I see that you want active participation. So now I'm going to call upon you to take your gold and silver and instead of making a golden calf, atone for it by making a home for me. You went to make an idol to worship another God. Now you will show your love for God by inviting me to live in your midst, to dwell in your midst, by building a home. Does God need a home? No, the whole universe is God's home. But God says, I want you to have an, a participation, an effort in drawing my presence down. I want you to welcome me, to build something designated for me to show that you really want me. It's like if you build a home and you build a special ensuite, I think it's called, for your parents. And you say, Mom, Dad, we built this beautiful home, but we also built a special apartment in the back. So whenever you want to come visit, you have your own space. That's really showing your parents that you want them to come. Because in the construction of your home, you made space for them because you really want them to come. And they always have an open invitation. They have their own suite in your house to move into. That shows your desire that you went through the effort and the expense to build a special place. And it shows you really want them to come and stay as long as possible and 
as often as possible. That's the same thing with God. We say, Hashem, we want you to dwell in our midst. We're going to designate a special home. You could pray to God in your home. You could pray to God in the street. You could pray to God in the ocean, any way you want. But Hashem, we show Hashem we love Him by designating a special home. So instead of giving gold, silver, and all the materials for a golden calf, do it to build a home for Hashem. That's number one. But to take it a step further, how do you unite a group of people? One of the ways is to give them a common purpose, a common mission, a common goal and vision. And you ask everyone to work together for this greater good. And suddenly we all become partners in this fulfillment of this goal. And we all are dependent on one another. You see, on the one hand, Judaism highly respects individuality. If you save one life, it's like you saved an entire world. If you killed one person, God forbid, it's like you killed an entire world. Judaism puts the greatest value on individual life. Every human being is in the image of God, men, women, and children, every race, every color, every for sure. The Talmud goes so far to say, everyone should say, the world was created for me. It's not arrogance. You should know Hashem made the world for you, just like he made the whole world for Adam, one human being. He'll make the whole world for you. So Judaism puts the highest value on individuality. But on the other hand, we all know that to pray, ideally, we need a minyan, we need a quorum. And we know that all of our prayers are said in the plural. Avinu, our father, Malkeinu, our king, Slachlanu, forgive us, Rifainu, heal us. We don't say heal me, heal my wife and kids, my family. my No, us, all of us collectively. We always pray in the collective. So Judaism has this amazing balance between individuality and collectivism. Why collectivism? Because spirituality is not meant to be practiced in Judaism as individuals. There's the communal. Spirituality is best found in a community. It goes all the way back to when God created Adam. What did God say? It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helpmate. I'll make a partner. Man is not designed to be alone. And therefore, we have the Mishkan. The Mishkan is, this is our collective home. where We all come together to meet and be in the presence of co-religionists in our quest and our desire and our yearning to come closer to Hashem. We seek spirituality, not as individuals. It's very interesting, I think, because in many other religions, individuality is how you find spirituality. You got to go be solitude, uh, you know, the typical image, somebody meditating on a mountaintop or on the beach. I'm very spiritual. It's all about my individual spirituality. Judaism says, go to shul to find spirituality. Why? First of all, because anytime you're around other people, you gain from the influence of others. You know, we all know this positive peer pressure, right? Why do people go to support groups, right? Because if you do something in a group, you have the influence of others. So just being in the presence of other people who are desiring to come closer to God makes you come closer to God. Any desire to come to be a better righteous person makes you better. You know, if I desire, if I'm thinking I really want to be rich, that desire doesn't make me any richer than I was before. But if I say I really want to be a good person, a kinder person, a more patient person, just the desire automatically makes me kinder and more patient. Now magnifying that when I'm in a room filled with people who are all desiring to be better and learning Torah and trying to improve themselves, that's going to have an influence on me. We all know the family you live in, the siblings you have, the classmates you have, the, the, the teachers you have, all of that shapes who you are. So going to shul on a regular basis and being with people who sincerely and genuinely want to come closer to Hashem and be better in every regard in man-to-man -man relationship, man-to-God, is going to make you a better person. So spirituality in Judaism is not done individually. It can be done individually, but it could even more effectively be done communally. And that's why all of our prayers are in the plural, because it's all communal. That's number one. The other reason why the building of the Mishkan was the antidote to the sin of the golden calf is because I showed you that the word Vayak 
Kel and Moses congregated, the name of this week's Torah portion, is the same word in the golden calf. But Yekahel, they congregated around Moses and Aaron. Now, here we have the idea that there are different types of communities. What's the difference between the community that Moses is creating versus the community that congregated around Aaron and said, Moses has left and he's not coming back. Let's make a golden calf. There's so many differences. The first difference is that that congregation was leaderless. They said, we don't have a leader. And they just panicked and went into a mode of fear and despair and frenzy and sort of... uh, uh, the crowd mentality, you know, the herd mentality, everyone just jumped in and said, uh, let's make a golden calf. As opposed to this week's Torah portion where there's a leader, Moshe Rabbeinu, who is guiding the crowd, who is guiding the congregants and the congregation and saying, let us make a home for Hashem. So the first thing is one is leaderless, one has a leader. The second thing is one has a a a, a purpose we're going to work together in a constructive, productive way for a higher purpose to build a home for Hashem. And everyone has to give a half a shekel. We're going to read that. We're going to read Shkalim this week. In other words, you're not going to get lost as individuals. Sometimes people say, well, if I'm in the crowd, I'm going to lose my individuality. No, you have your individual contribution you have to make. And everyone is dependent on your contribution. So therefore, you're part of a community where you're needed. And therefore, you don't lose your individuality. As opposed to a frenzied mob crowd mentality that... And and we all know these two crowds when we see it, right? I mean, sometimes you go to an event and there's this audience and this crowd that's working for a higher purpose, a noble goal, and there's structure and there's organization and there's respect and there's decorum and there's politeness, and there is listening to each other. And you know, this is a a congregation of people who are working for something in a positive, constructive way. And sometimes you come into a scene, you could see it uh, on the streets of uh, protests in cities or different scenes where everyone's just fighting and screaming and the chaos and lack of any structure or organization. It's just raw anger passion fear all those terrible emotions and it's it's uh reflected in the disrespect for one another in the in the the uh confrontational means in which it's being carried out and one brings out the best of human nature a leader leading a congregation in a positive direction for a greater good, for a higher purpose. And one brings out the worst animalistic aggressiveness and anger and negative traits. I think of social media as something along those lines. You know, sometimes you go in social media and you see the comments and the videos and the, 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 the you see the most vile and, uh, hate-filled comments and right it's all it's all anonymous you know people just go on and post all their right it's a community of people it's called social media right now i'm not saying you could go into social media and see wonderful groups and wonderful directed you know parents trying to be better parents or people trying to help cure an illness and that's very productive but when you go into some of these conversations and you see the anger and the hate and the the disrespect that's shown from one person to the other. So the Mishkan is the tikkun, it's the rectification for the sin of the golden calf. Instead of coming together and congregating for destructive purposes to make a golden calf and doing it in a way that there is inner chaos and quarreling and tension, the men rip the jewelry off their wives, all of that, as opposed to let's build a beautiful tabernacle. And that's why one of the things about the Mishkan, and people often say, why so many details about the precise measurements? Every vessel, every R article, the specific materials and measurements, why all the detail? And the answer is, you know, it's all about the details. When something is not structured, it's just rip the jewelry off your spouse's, throw it in the fire, make a golden cap. As opposed to, an accounting 
of everything that was contributed and everyone had to give a certain amount and everything was done specifically according to God's instructions. The specificity shows the care and the concern to get everything right in the fashion that God desired to build it. And that's a complete reversal and atonement and rectification for the sin of the golden calf. But just like the Mishkan represents our communal, collective spirituality as a nation that we achieve. And by the way, do you know what the original name of the synagogue is? You know, we call it a synagogue. I'm not sure in Greek what that means exactly. Um, but in Hebrew, it's called the Bet HaKneset, the house of gathering. The emphasis is that it's a place where we gather together. Even before the fact that it's a house of prayer and a house of Torah study and a house of kindness, it's a house of gathering. The fact that we gather with other people who have similar goals and visions for life and for serving Hashem, that ennobles us and elevates us automatically. The minute you step into shul, you will not leave the same person you came in. But here we come to the second thing, and that is actually the first thing, which is Shabbat. And that's because Shabbat is more important than the Mishkan. They were not allowed to build the Mishkan on Shabbat because the holiness of time, which is Shabbat, precedes the holiness of space. And until today, you're not allowed to build a synagogue on Shabbat. You may say, well, we're building a house of God. Let's get it done as soon as possible. Let's have the construction crew work seven days a week. No, don't violate the holiness of time to build the holiness of space. But what is Shabbat? Shabbat is a tabernacle in time. Just like you have a physical tabernacle or a physical synagogue or Bet HaKnesset, the house of worship, a dwelling place for God, Shabbat is an island in time or it's a palace in time. It's a mishkan in time where you come together and keep Shabbat, not just your family, but your servants, your maid servants, as the Torah says, and your community. And once again, the whole idea of Shabbat is spirituality, connection to God, holy day, Jewish holiness, which is spirit, Jewish spirituality, connection to Hashem. And I say that because spirituality doesn't just mean that I do yoga. You know, that may be relaxing and meditative, but it's not holiness and spirituality is bringing God into your relationships, into your life, into your consciousness. But having said that, what Mishkan is in space, Shabbat is in time. Now, ideally, you go to the synagogue in Shabbat, so you have holiness of time and holiness of space combined. But Shabbat in itself is a, is a tabernacle of communal spirituality. You know, people always say, oh, Shabbat's a day of rest. But it's much more than a day of rest. Yes, you have to rest. That's the way you make space to fill that time with spirituality, with holiness. And what is Jewish spirituality? Communal. You sit with your family, you sit with your friends, you sit with your community, whether it's in prayer or in Torah study or in eating the Shabbat meals. But it's about being together as a community. You know, some people have said, oh, if you keep Shabbat, you have a vacation every week. It's like a built-in vacation. Who wouldn't want a weekly vacation? You get 25 hours of vacation every week. And it's better than a vacation because people go on vacation and unfortunately, they have to work on vacation, right? How many times do people go on vacation? They take their laptop with them because they have to do some work in the hotel at night or they have to answer emails at night or they have to answer text messages. Shabbat, the beauty of it is that you can't do any of the above. So you put away your phone, you put away your computer, you can't answer anyone, okay? And you have to be completely on vacation, so to speak, for the entire 25 hours from sundown to sunset, from Friday night to Saturday night, right? However, one second. However, and this is the important point, don't think of Shabbat as a mere vacation. It's much more than a vacation. Why? Because a vacation, everyone takes their own vacation. You could go on vacation with your spouse, with your family, but you go on your own. You don't take your whole community on vacation with you. You would almost say it's not a vacation if I'm taking my whole community with me. 
holiday of vacation, I want to get away from everyone and everything. Shabbat is a vacation, but the whole community takes the vacation together. Again, it's about being communal together. By yakel, to come together as a community. But there's another beautiful thing about Shabbat. And that is vacations cost money. Go book a vacation, right? What do you have to do? You got to buy tickets. You got to get a hotel room. You got to, eh, it's not cheap, right? Shabbat is a free vacation. Why? Because everyone could participate. Not everyone could afford vacations. Yeah, some people can't afford to go on vacations. That's why they're staycations, right? Shabbat is a vacation, a vacation from the daily chores and tasks, and not just physical, but mentally as well, and emotionally and spiritually. Everyone's invited onto this vacation, and it doesn't matter rich or poor. Your maidservants, everyone gets to be on this vacation. You don't have to pay for it. It's a gift. Hashem gives you the gift of Shabbat every week. That's number two. And obviously, a vacation is a physical pleasure, a physical relaxation, a physical enjoyment. Shabbat is a spiritual experience. Not just physical. Yeah, we eat good food and we wear nice clothing and we drink wine and we say Kiddush. Yeah, it has great pleasures. And there are other things you're supposed to do on Shabbat that are pleasurable. Husbands and wives are intimate on Friday night. It's a beautiful day of relaxation. It's the only day you could take a nap two o'clock in the afternoon and everything's good, right? Who gets to nap on a Monday afternoon or a Tuesday afternoon? Shabbos afternoon, you finish your meal, you go take a little schlaf. It's beautiful. But much more than a physical vacation, it's a spiritual vacation. Why? Because you learn Torah and you pray and you sing Shabbat. And you connect to Hashem and you declare that Hashem created the world in six days. and right. You connect with your family, with your friends. You learn with your children. You study. Give a Dvar Torah at the Shabbos table, right? It's a spiritual vacation, which not just gives relaxation to your body, which is important, but it rejuvenates your soul and inspires you to take on the next week, elevates you. So now you know why the opening of the Torah portion is Shabbat and the Mishkan, because the Jews congregated as a community in madness and insanity and despair and panic and fear, all the negative traits that drove them to make a golden calf. And God says, now you will work together collectively for a higher purpose. And that higher purpose is manifested in the holiness of the Mishkan, which is holiness in time, in space, I should say, and holiness of uh, time, which is the weekly observance of Shabbat. And until today, we're blessed to have these two Mitzvot, we have the synagogue, which is the, uh, the the replacement of the original Mishkan, where we serve God in space, coming together. And we also have Shabbat every week, which allows us to observe Shabbat in, uh, in time. So I want to just dwell for a minute on this idea of the day after Yom Kippur. We know that Yom Kippur became a permanent day of forgiveness, atonement. Why? Because originally that is the day that God forgave for the, the terrible sin of the golden calf. But what's fascinating is that when does Moses begin to teach the laws of Shabbat and the Mishkan? Rashi says that it was the day after Yom Kippur. In other words, Moses immediately takes this atonement for the Jewish people and says, now we're going to concretize it. We want to make sure that this relationship, the repair and the broken relationship between God and the Jewish people is permanent, everlasting, and enduring. And the way we're going to do that is by immediately implementing these laws of Shabbat and the Mishkan. And it's a very good lesson in life. You know, sometimes we have a moment of inspiration or more than a moment, and it's you know, people go to Israel, they're very inspired, or whatever it may be. It's always important. It's it's I think there's a term, the day after, right? The day after means what happens the day after. You had this great high and you had this great experience, but what happens the day after? Does it continue? Does it carry forth? Does it have a lasting impact or is it just left behind in the moment? And that's really uh, something we have to choose to do to 
always say to ourselves, if I experience, you know, someone once said the uh, inspiration doesn't last, but neither does bathing. That's why it's required daily. We always have to re-inspire ourselves. That's why we pray every day and we learn Torah every day and we do mitzvot every day. But it's not enough to just feel inspiration. S inspiration is from the word spirit. You get a spiritual boost. But now I got to take that energy from the spiritual boost. I have to take the fuel, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and I have to say, how can I make sure that it lasts? And how does Hashem tell the Jewish people to make that forgiveness and their uh, rep uh, uh, render that that re reunion that they had with God after He forgave them for the golden calf, the reconciliation after that ultimate sin. How do we keep the relationship intact permanently? Shabbat and the Mishkan. That will be we will maintain our relationship with Hashem and make sure we never, God forbid, repeat that mistake or that sin. And everyone in our own lives. Uh, uh, a moment of inspiration or an experience that's uplifting is a gift, but you have to make sure it doesn't fizzle. It doesn't fade. Okay. You know, inspiration could be, you ever open a can of Coke or any soda. It's, it's all that excitement, right? Leave the can for a week and it's flat. It's gone. The Coke is still there, but it's all dry. You know, it's, it, there's no excitement. There's no frizzle. Same thing as with Hashem. And any inspiration, when you feel that excitement, say, okay, how do I keep hold on to it? How do I maintain it? And that's why we have Shabbat every week. And we go to the synagogue regularly for all of those reasons to maintain that closeness, that attachment with Hashem. And that's why Moses doesn't wait. The day after Yom Kippur is the day he implements this, uh, these mitzvot of Shabbat and Mishkan. I want to talk about the word congregation for a minute. Because, you know, everyone knows, you know, the, the typical joke in the temple, the congregation may rise, the congregation may be seated. Uh, if you read in the sitter, the congregation responds this, a congregation, right? A synagogue has a congregation, fine. But in English, it's called a congregation. In Hebrew, there are actually three different names for community which represents three different types of communities. One is the word kihila or kahal, from the word vayakel, gathered together. Many times you see congregation such and such. In Hebrew, it's kahal so and so. Even in our prayers on Shabbat, we pray, we pray for the entire holy congregation. A kihila in Hebrew is a congregation, a very familiar way to say congregation. That's number one. That's one way to say congregation. Another way to say congregation is tzibur. There's another word for congregation. A matter of fact, the chazan who goes to lead the service is called the shliach tzibur, the emissary of the congregation. So you have tzibur. And then you have eda. A matter of fact, in the opening verses, by Yakel Moshe, Moses congregated at Kol Adat B'nei Yisrael, the entire assembly of the children of Israel. So Eda assembly is another name for the Jew, for a congregation. Now, what is the difference between in Hebrew? If you have three different names, they have a nuance. There's a, a slight distinction in the type of a community. So there are three types of communities. One type of community is from the word Eda. Eda, the root of the word Eda is aid. Aid means witness. Sometimes a community is formed because they all witness the same thing. People have a shared experience, a shared past experience, and that shared past experience unites them, and they become a congregation because of their shared past experience. That is number one, Eda, right? Then you have a kahal. A kahal is a group. So it does people who have sheared past. Like the Jews who left Egypt, they witnessed the splitting of the sea and the ten plagues and the revelation of Mount Sinai, and they journeyed through the day. All that they had a sheared common experience, right? Then you have the other extreme, which is Vayakel. Vayakel is people who have no uh, sheared past, 
but they have a shared vision and goal as Jews, and they come together and unite to become a community. So most congregations today are called Kila because most synagogues, I mean, sometimes you go and say, okay, this is a synagogue that was built by the Holocaust survivors, or this was a synagogue that was built by the continents in Russia. They had a shared experience, so they prayed together. Or well, these are Jews that immigrated from this community and they're shared, whatever. But most synagogues, when you walk into a synagogue today, you have people from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, all different uh, involvements and levels of background, knowledge, education, you know, you know, age gaps, uh, it's intergenerational, it's uh, people from different countries even, or different places coming together. So it's a, a mixture of a lot of diverse people from many different Jewish backgrounds, many different life experiences, many different ages and stages of life, but they share one thing in common. They're Jews, they want to serve Hashem, they come together to join the congregation. And they form a new unit. All these people, they become... Today, you call it members. You don't have to be a member. You become a, a participant, a congregant, and you're part of this community. This becomes your extended family of people that you join together with in prayer and Torah study and good deeds. That's a key lot, a group of people that merge together and form one unit from a very diverse group of people. And that's your, that's your, your typical average congregation. You walk in, this guy's from here, she's from there, different backgrounds, different stages of life. Yeah, and they all become one. And then you have the third category, which is tzibur. Now, if you look at the word tzibur, literally, it means to pile up. In Talmud, many times you find sabur, to pile up, to gather, right? What is a tzibur? A tzibur is a group of people from diverse backgrounds, but they don't become a permanent community. They become... They're like piled up temporarily to become a congregation. And the best example with this would be you're at the Western Wall at the Kotel, and what happens? Someone's looking for a minion, and they call people together to pray in a quorum because we need a community. And 10 random people come together, and they pray one of the services. It could be Shacharit, which takes an hour. It could be Mincha, which takes 20 minutes. And after the minion's over, they say, Yashukoach, and they all go their other ways. This congregation, this community lasted for 20 minutes or a half hour or an hour, depending on how long. And they were a congregation. And the shliach, Sibur, was the emissary of that congregation who led the services. And this guy's from South Africa, and this guy's from England, and this guy's from America, and this guy's from Jerusalem, and everyone's from a different place. And they made a congregation. But after the prayer was over, they went their separate ways. They're no longer a congregation. They were, in that time and place, a congregation. It could have been a minion in the airport or at a gala dinner or wherever it may be. What's the greatest uh, of all these three? The name we use most often is Kehila. Why? Because when you have an Ada, everyone's similar. Everyone has the same background. So that's the, the, the advantage, but that's the, also the disadvantage. They don't have that much that they could give and contribute to one another because they all have similar experiences. Then you have the Tzibor, which is very diverse, but it's short-lived. It's only for a very limited period of time. The greatest community is the Kihila, and that's why most synagogues are called Kihila or Kahal. Because basically you take people from different backgrounds, from different perspectives, different experiences, different even Jewish cultures, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, Yemenite, whatever maybe, and they all blend together to form a cohesive, collective, unified community. And because everyone is different, and everyone comes with their uniqueness and their strengths and their backgrounds and their life experiences and their abilities, they could all help one another. One person is more knowledgeable and he could help somebody who's less knowledgeable. One person is more successful and they could help somebody who's starting out and needs some financial help or needs a, a job or something like that. One person is lonely. They don't have a family. This one can invite them to their home because they have a family. Sometimes you have synagogues, young families congregation. Everyone in this congregation is young families with kids. Well, sometimes people like going to that congregation because I'm going to be with other young families. But we're all in a similar situation. We can't help each other so much. The beauty of 
a synagogue, the more typical synagogue like ours is, it's intergenerational. So the older people see the little children, they're like, oh, I haven't seen children for all week. I come to shul, I see these beautiful children. And the young single person doesn't have a Shabbos table to eat at because they don't have a family. The young family invites that person to their home, right? And, and the young person who's starting out in life and needs some advice could go to the elderly experience and say, give me some advice. And, and this one's an accountant, this one's a lawyer, and this one's, a, you know, how many times people call me, Rabbi, do you know a good lawyer? Do you know a good doctor? Do you know, right? Oh, we have someone in our community who could help you with that. And someone in our community, could help. You need, I need someone to help me with financial things. I need someone to help me with, this. I need a psychiatrist. I need a psychologist. A community has everyone in it, and everybody could help each other. And that's what a kihila is, and that's why it says, Vayakel Moshe, and that's why that becomes, till today, the most prominent uh term used to explain what a community is. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a man that's featured very prominently in this week's Torah portion. You may have heard his name. His name is Bitzalel. Who is Bitzalel? He was the chief artisan who designed, manufactured, produced all of the beautiful vessels and the construction of the Mishkan. To quote the verse, it's chapter 35, verse 31. It actually starts in verse 30. Moses said to the children of Israel, see Hashem is proclaimed by name Bitzalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. He filled them with godly spirit, with wisdom, insight, and knowledge, and with every craft to weave designs, to work with gold, silver, and copper, stone cutting for setting, and wood carving, to perform every craft by design. And then he gave him an assistant, Aliyah ben Achisamach, from the tribe of Dan. Okay? So Betzal is the chief artisan, and he's a very talented individual. He knows how to work. You know, some people know how to work with metal, but they don't know how to work with wood. Some people know how to work with wood and metal, but they don't know how to work with fabrics, right? With weaving. He knew how to do everything, every craft, every design. He was the ultimate artist. You know, people who make sculptures don't know how to paint necessarily. People who know how to paint don't know how to make sculptures. People who know how to do that don't know how to maybe, you know, do fabrics and weave beautiful artistic designs. He could do everything. So clearly he was endowed with a godly spirit, a divine ability, a spiritual ability to be able to be this great artist. And I think in Jerusalem there's a school, an art school, uh, called Bitzalel Institute, named after him, where Israeli artists go to learn art. It's the most prominent place in Israel. It's like the, what's it, Julie Art in, in America. So he was designated. So right away, our rabbis look at his name, Bitzalel. Bi means in. Tzel means shadow. El is God's name. So his very name says he was in the shadow of God. Now, what does that mean in the shadow of God? So what is a shadow? When you have light, you're going to have a shadow. The bigger the light, the bigger the shadow. Somebody who is in the light of Hashem, they're divinely infused with spiritual light, they're going to reflect that with the shadow. So God is the infinite light or in self, and we could create a shadow, so to speak. And by the way, there is something called Hidur Mitzvah, the verse says, this is my God and I will beautify him, I will glorify him, and our rabbis say the way we do that is with beautifying our mitzvot. So we like to make the synagogue beautiful, just like the Mishkan. We like to get a beautiful pier to fill in, a beautiful etrog to shake on Sukkot, a beautiful shofar, a beautiful talit, a beautiful menorah, a beautiful Shabbos candlesticks, right? You could put two uh, candles uh, on a tinfoil and light them, but you have beautiful silver candlesticks, so beautiful ceramic ones. That's called beautifying the mitzvah. Why? Because we're human beings and we are impacted and affected by aesthetics. You go into a beautiful home, a beautiful building, a beautiful, you have a beautiful object, you're wearing a beautiful shirt, a beautiful dress, whatever you're wearing, you feel different. You're impacted. So therefore, the we should beautify the mitzvah to honor Hashem and elevate ourselves so our eyes will be surrounded with visual, attractive Jewish symbols that will elevate our spirit. And he is Bitzalel, he is in the shadow of God, meaning an artist is somebody who's divinely inspired. Now, something interesting about art. 
Someone once posed the following question. You could walk into a art gallery and you could see a beautiful painting of a bowl of fruit. And you say, how much is this bowl of fruit? And they say, oh, this is by a very famous artist. This painting of this bowl of fruit is, I don't know, let's take a number, $100,000. And you may say, one minute, I can go to Publix and get the original fruit. Everything in that bowl, the grapes, the pears, the apples, the bananas, whatever's in it. I could put that whole bowl together in the real original for about $25. So why would I pay $100,000 for a painting of a bowl of fruit when I could get the actual fruit for $25? And the answer obviously is, that the fruit is God's work. Only God can make that fruit. You can't make real fruit. But what you're paying $100,000 is for the imperfect recreation. On the one hand, the artwork will never be authentic. It will never be original. It will not be the actual fruit. But it's man's ability to be in the light of God, the shadow, to take something God made and then recreate it. So you have a painting of a person. The person is God's handiwork. That's Hashem's light. Only Hashem can make a human being. But you can make a portrait of somebody, and if it's a good portrait, and it, it's very valuable. So all artwork is trying to recreate what Hashem designed, what Hashem made. And that's why B'Tzalel is called someone who is in the shadow of Hashem. Um, now, an artist... I'm not an artist. We have a daughter, Hindi, who's an artist. An artist has the ability to see things in a unique light and project that into a painting. And in that way, we're all artists to some degree or another. When we see people in their fine, you know, someone said, treat your friends like expensive paintings. Put them in a good light. When we treat people, when we see people, how we perceive people is a work of art, okay? Um... You know, an artist could look at something that you or an average person, they don't see the beauty, but the artist sees it and draws it out, literally and figuratively, on a painting. And he draws out the beauty of how he sees that. Everyone sees that building or that object, but he portrays it in a unique light. And that's where the creative genius of the artist comes in, right? It's their view, their prism that they're projecting. And I think all of us have that ability to see people in a unique light, to see them in their best light. And I remember hearing a story where there was once a king. And he hired a very fine artist to paint a portrait of him. But there was one problem. The problem is that the king had a scar on his forehead. And the artist had a dilemma. On the one hand, if he takes out the scar... It's not an accurate portrayal of the king. Everyone knows the king has a scar. So it won't be a, an accurate portrait. On the other hand, if he paints the king with a scar, it will be disrespectful to the king. So you know what he did? Came up with a solution. He presented the king with the artwork, his portrait. And when the king looked, you know what he saw? It was a picture of the king sitting at his desk, deep in thought, with his hand over his forehead. So in that light, everything was accurate, but the scar was covered by the king's hand. And that's what an artist could do. An artist could see things in a positive light, to not focus on the scars, but to focus on the beauty. And in that way, whether we're literally artists or not, we could all be artists. Another fascinating subject that emerges from this week's Torah portion is women. The Torah says very clearly that the women gave more generously to the building of the Mishkan than the men. The women were more generous. And remember that they did not want to give to the golden calf, which means that they both withheld their generosity for the wrong reasons, the golden calf, but gave more generously when it came to the building of the Mishkan. But not only did the women give more generously, they also helped with a lot of the weaving and designing as women are capable of doing. And this is just another example of the women outpacing the men. We know the women were the ones who was in their merit that we went out of Egypt. And now in their merit, we uh, have this beautiful Mishkan and a great testimony to the women. 
But another fascinating thing in this week's Torah portion, it says that the work or the contributions was more than enough. And Moses had to say, we're no longer accepting contributions. So all in all, the entire Jewish people were extremely generous. And it's interesting, it says it was enough and there was more. Why? Because part of being enough is that there should be more. So everyone should realize that nobody is indispensable. It's not like the temple needs you to build it. The tabernacle needs you. It's more that you get the privilege to participate and contribute to the Mishkan. Um, the Torah portion goes through all the vessels and all the objects that were built in the Mishkan. But the first vessel that the Kohen encountered when he entered into the temple every day was the wash basin, the, the laver of copper. And the Torah says it was of copper made from the mirrors that the women contributed. The women used to polish the copper to make mirrors, and now when they needed copper for the labor, they gave it. And there's a famous Rashi from the rabbis quoting a midrash that says that at first Moses rejected these gifts. He says, I'm not taking mirrors. Mirrors are for the evil inclination. It's for vanity. Why would I want that in the holy temple? And God said, this gift is the most precious of all. Why? Because when the men were doing backbreaking labor in Egypt, slavery, the women, says Rashi, would bring food and drink to their husbands in the field in this, in the, in, in, as they were building the cities for Pharaoh. And they would beautify themselves with their mirrors. And they would bring their mirrors and show the reflection of themselves and their husbands in the mirror and say, look how beautiful we look together. Oh, I'm more beautiful than you. And by doing this, they would increase their appetite and their desire to be intimate with them. And through that, the women basically seduced their husbands and were able to procreate and get pregnant and have children in Egypt during the slavery. Because the men were exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally. They didn't want to procreate. Why bring children into a, into a, into a society of slaves? And the boys have to be drowned in the Nile. But the women understood, once again, that without children, there won't be a nation to go free when the time for the redemption goes. And so God says, this is the most precious of all vessels. And it will be the first one that the Kohen will use when he starts his daily service. And I just want to mention that although we are not Kohenim, we still practice this till today. Because when you get up in the morning, the first thing you say is, Modani, thank you, God, for restoring my soul that I'm alive. And the next thing we do is we wash our hands six times, like the Kohen who washed his hands from the labor. Because we begin our daily service of God every morning when we wake up. And like the Kohen, we cleanse our hands, we raise our hands in cleanliness and say, may this day be a day that we utilize our hands for godly, holy, lofty purposes. Our hands should be clean from anything that is improper or forbidden. And it all goes back to the women contributing from their golden, I'm sorry, their copper mirrors with which the Mishkan was created. So that is the story of the um, of the golden of the of the copper mirrors that the women contributed okay now we will spend a few minutes talking about the second special reading that we're going to have this shabbat which is parshat shkalim this shabbat we're going to take out two torahs in the synagogue one for the weekly torah portion which we just discussed by yakel and the second one is Parshat Shkalim. There are four special readings that we read between this Shabbat and Passover and for four special occasions. And this week, we're going to read Shekalim. Shekalim is about the half shekels that the Jewish people gave for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle. We actually read it in last week's Torah portion as part of the weekly Torah portion. But now we're going to have a special reading about it, okay? Why? Because this Shabbat is the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh Adar 2. This year we had two Adars. But the second Adar 
starts next week. Let me see what day of the week it is. I might as well know now. March. So Adar is, is on Monday. Of, it's actually two days, Adar. It's Sunday and Monday of this coming week is Rosh Chodesh. And the custom is that the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh, and this year it's the Rosh Chodesh that we read, uh, that we celebrate Purim, which is this coming Adar base. The Shabbos before is the reading of Shkalim. What does Shkalim, the half shekel, have to do with Rosh Chodesh Adar and the holiday of Purim? So our rabbis tell us that basically what happened was uh, Haman offered 10,000 silver coins to Ahasuerus to destroy the Jewish people. King Ahasuerus says, you could keep the money, you could destroy them nonetheless. Terrible anti-Semitic statement. Our rabbis say, analogy, there were two people. One had a mound of dirt, and one had a pit in their field. So the person with the pit came to the guy with the field, with the mound, and said, I need to fill my ditch. Can I buy the mound of dirt from you? And the person who owned the mound of dirt in his field says, you don't have to pay me for it. I want to get rid of it. It's sticking out of my field. I want to dispose of it. You could take it for free. And that's Haman and Achashverosh. Haman says, I want to bury the Jews alive. I want to take the uh, fill my ditch. And Achashverosh says, you don't have to pay me for that. They're a mound. They're interlopers in our, in our We don't need them here. Get rid of them. Take them. So horrible situation, obviously. Two people plotting to destroy the Jewish people, Haman and Achashverosh. And but Haman or Haman offers 10,000 silver coins. And God says, the Jewish nation already gave half shekels to build a Mishkan a thousand years earlier. And therefore, their good coins that were given with love will now stand up and counteract the evil coins of Haman and foil his plot. So it was in the merit of the coins that we were saved. And because we were saved in the merit of the coins, we give every, we read about the half shekels. And by the way, when you come to Shul on the night of Purim, there's a custom to give the half shekels. There's a, usually a basket with three half dollars, and you could redeem it for dollar fifty, and they're symbolically giving the half shekels. So that's why we're going to read about the half shekels on this Shabbat, because it's the Shabbat that precedes the holiday of Purim, and that's why we're going to read it this year. And of course, the overriding message of the half shekel is that the rich cannot give more, the poor cannot give less. Everyone has to give a half shekel to show that we are all intrinsically half of the other with Hashem, with each one another, and we are not complete without one another. And it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, and it doesn't just mean financially rich or poor, but whether you're rich or poor in any area of life, you always have to remember you are incomplete without the next person. You are dependent on the next person. No person is an island unto themselves. And every person has to realize that there's so much they can gain from the next person. As it says in Perkei Avot, do not dismiss any human being, because there's no person that doesn't have their hour and no thing that doesn't have their its time. And to conclude the story, there was a brilliant professor who needed to get across a lake, so he hired a simple fisherman to row him across the lake. And it was a couple of hour ride, so the professor tried to engage him in conversation. He said, tell me, what do you think about this subject? The guy says, I don't know much about that. I never studied that. What do you think about this subject, that subject? Tries bringing up anything possible, nature, philosophy, psychology, religion. The guy has nothing to say about anything. So the professor in his mind thinks, what a waste of a human being. I can't even talk about anything. You know, he's, he's a nobody. You know, he's a, uh, completely irrelevant to me. Well, the boat capsizes and tips over. And the professor knew a lot of things, but he didn't know how to swim. And who saves his life? The fisherman rescues him and takes him to dry land. And the professor says, you know, never think someone's not important. You never know who could save your life. But it's not just the idea that someone could save your life. That's true, too. But you never know what you could learn from someone. As it says in Ethics of Our Fathers, who is a wise person? One who learns from everyone. Everyone can teach you something. Everyone has their area of contribution that they could make. And therefore, always realize you're half. You're incomplete without the next person. This is the way we go into the month of Adar because as we started, 
It's all about community. It's all about connections. It's all about relationships. Jewish spirituality is practiced in a communal setting and recognition that we all are interdependent and interrelated uh, to one another is the foundation of all of our observance of spirit, of connection, of being a community in the presence of Hashem. It's not good for man to be alone, as God told Adam. And therefore, we come together as a community, and the half shekel reminds us of this once again. And as the month of Adar is the time of joy, a person cannot find joy alone. Joy you find with others. You know, when you have a happy occasion, whether it's a bar mitzvah or a wedding, whatever it is, you, you, you don't elope. You invite your friends and community. Why? Because that magnifies the joy. When you have good news, the first thing you want to do is call and tell somebody. And if you can't get through to the people you love, you're like burning with a desire to share the good news because the more people you share it with, the more the joy grows. So wishing everyone a great day and thank you all for joining and hope to see you all soon. Bye.